Today, we're going to continue our look at the fundamental theorem of calculus, which states the following. If we have a continuous function on a closed interval, then the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is capital F at b minus capital F at a, where capital F is an antiderivative of f of x. That is, capital F prime is f of x. So another way we can write down the fundamental theorem is to say that if we integrate a derivative, if we integrate a derivative we just get the change in the function the definite integral of a derivative on an interval is the change in the function on that interval the definite integral of a function Sorry, the definite integral of a derivative on an interval is the amount of change in the function over that interval. It's how much the function has changed on the interval from A to B. It's the difference between F at B where we ended up and F at A where we started. So the definite integral of a derivative on an interval is the change in the function over the interval. Remember that derivative we can also say is rate of change. So the definite integral of a rate of change on an interval The definite integral of a rate of change on an interval is the change in the function over the interval. So this is going to lead us to how to interpret the definite integral. So for example, if a function say capital F at T is position or distance at time T, then F prime of T is the rate of change of distance at a particular time. Velocity is the rate of change of distance. Well, specifically, it's the rate of change of difference of distance with respect to time. So if distance is being measured in, let's say, meters, so if distance is in meters, and time is in seconds, then the velocity will be in meters per second.
So if we integrate the velocity, since the velocity is the derivative of the distance with respect to time or the rate of change of the distance with respect to time, if we integrate the velocity with respect to time, oops, if we integrate from time A to time B, the velocity, with respect to time, our result will be change in distance from time t equals a to t equals b. Another way that we could think about that will help us interpret what the definite integral represents is to look at the units. If the, if the units of velocity are in meters per second, and time is being measured in seconds, we can think of the dt as being time in seconds, our units are just going to be the units of velocity multiplied by the units of time. The seconds cancel out. Our distance will be in meters. Because if we take meters per second and multiply by seconds, we end up with meters. This is connected to our earlier idea of thinking of the definite integral as the area under a curve and above an interval. So if we look at, if we think of this in terms of area, on the vertical axis, we have velocity. And on the horizontal axis, we have time. We have some velocity in meters per second. And we have some interval in seconds. Definite integral is going to calculate for us an area and the way we can calculate the units for this area if velocity is being measured in meters per second and time is being measured in seconds, then the area is in meters per second times seconds. In this case, our multiplication is distance is equal to rate times time. And we do the same thing, meters per second multiplied by seconds. If we just interpret in terms of area, then we have meters in uh, on the vertical axis and meters on the horizontal axis the units will be area because it'll be meters multiplied by meters. So we multiply the units and that will tell us what we're looking at. So if we want to interpret what a definite integral represents, we need to look at the units of the function we're integrating and the units of the variable over which we are, that we're integrating with respect to. And that will tell us the units of the definite integral. The definite integral, uh, 
or integration in general just represents multiplication, but one of the factors is variable. Multiplication, but one of the factors, in this case, the velocity or the rate is variable. If I had a constant rate, I would just get to multiply the rate times the time and life would be easy. We just get to use multiplication. But if our rate is variable, then we have to use integration. The way we built the integral in the first place was to assume that the rate was constant for a small change in time so that we get to use multiplication and then just add up all of those areas. The units will help us interpret what the definite integral represents. If we're integrating a rate of change, the definite integral of a rate of change on an interval gives you the change in the function over that interval. Moreover, the area will tell you how much the function is changing. So the definite integral of a derivative or a rate of change on an interval will tell you the change in the function over the interval. The area will tell you how much it changed, the function changed. So let's take a look at an example. Yeah. Let's take a look at an example. Where we're looking at the derivative. So we could, and we can see where the derivative is going to be positive and negative. So we'll be able to see where the function is increasing and decreasing. And we're going to use the area to determine how much of an increase or decrease we see. So for example, we're going to draw a graph of a function. Twenty one twice. I'm draw, gonna draw a function that just consists of a bunch of line segments. So my function is going to be, it's just gonna be the line from negative two up to three. And then this is gonna continue up to six, two. And it's going to stay flat from six to nine. And then it's going to drop down from two to zero as we go from nine to 12. So here's my graph of F prime of T. Let's think about some things that we know. We're looking at the graph of the derivative. And we can see that the graph of the derivative is negative from zero to three. Or so we'll say that the derivative is negative from zero to three. So the function is decreasing 
on the interval from zero to three. So first we notice that here, the graph of the derivative is below the x-axis. So we'll say that f prime is negative on the interval from zero to three. That means that f will be decreasing on the interval from zero to three. What we have added to this is that the area tells us how much decrease we see. So the area of area in here, I'll call it A1. A1 is equal to one, it's a triangle. So we'll do one half times the base of three times the height of two. Three. So since the area A1 is three, F decreases by three on the interval from zero to three. So what we have no, learned now with this area business, we now know that the F decreases by three on the interval from zero to three. In terms of the fundamental theorem of calculus, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that the definite integral from zero to three of f prime of, I wrote x, I meant to write t, of t dt is negative three, just because what we found out with the area business. So f, uh, the integral from zero to three of f prime of t dt is equal to negative three. Three because it's the area, negative because this function, the derivative, f prime is below the x-axis, sorry, the t-axis. But from the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is capital F at three minus capital F at zero. If we move the three, uh, if we solve for f of zero, if we put the f of zero over here on this side and then the three on this side, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to solve the other way around. If I solve this for f of three, we can rewrite this part of it by saying that f of three is f of zero minus three. So whatever we had for f of zero, we are now three lower than that. On the interval from three to six, we see that the derivative is positive. We see that F prime is positive on the interval from three to six. So capital F is increasing on the interval from three to six. This is something that we would have concluded before. We see the derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. What we have now is that the area tells us how much increase. So if we look at this area from three to six, A2 is just gonna be one half the base times the height. So now we know that F increases by three on the interval from three to six. And we can make the same, um, we can do the same analysis that we did with the, def the fundamental theorem. If we look at the integral from three to six of f prime of t dt, this will be a positive three. 
three because of the area and positive because the function, is, the derivative is above the T axis. The fundamental theorem of calculus says that the, inter the definite integral from three to six of F prime of T dt is capital F at six minus capital F at three. So if we solve this for F of six, put the F of three on this side, whatever we, wherever we were at F of three, we will increase by three. Oops. Wherever we were at F of three, we'll increase by three because that's the area. And then we can keep going. On the interval from six to nine, on the interval from six to nine, we see that the, um, the derivative is positive, so the function is increasing. So we'll say uh, F prime is positive still on the interval from six to nine. So capital F is increasing on the interval from six to nine. And the area will tell us by, by how much. So on the interval from six to nine, if I break this down uh, and call this A3, we could see that A3 is just a rectangle, length times width, So it looks like capital F will increase by six on the interval from six to nine. Then finally, on the interval from nine to 12, we see that F prime is still positive on the interval from nine to 12. So, capital F is still increasing on the interval from nine to 12. And the area will tell us by how much. So if we go back up to our drawing, uh, I call this A4. Uh, A4 is just a triangle. So we'll say A4 is one half the base times the height. So F increases by three on the interval from nine to 12. We could combine the last three areas into one trapezoid. And the area of that trapezoid is just uh, 12. The average of the base nine plus the base three multiplied by the height two gives us 12. It's also the sum of these three areas, the two triangles and the rectangle. So three, three, and six. So we could say that F prime is positive on the interval from three to 12. So F is increasing on the interval from three to 12. And the area tells us by how much. So F increases by 12 on the interval from nine to 12. Now, if we summarize our results in a table of values, so let's suppose that we have a table where we have T at zero, three, six, nine, and 12. And we wanna know the values of capital F at T. Notice that we don't know any of these values. We just know how much things have changed. We know that from zero to three, we see a decrease by three. From three to six, we see an increase of three. From six to nine, we'll see an increase of six. And from nine to 12, we'll see an increase of three.
actually find out values for capital F, we would need to know at least one value of F. So to actually fill out values, we would need to know an extra piece of information about the function. So to fill out the table, or the, the areas are only telling us the changes. If we want to complete this table, we'll need at least one value for F. Some other things that we might notice, just looking at the graph of the derivative, something else that we might notice is we might notice that uh, f prime is increasing on the interval from zero to six. So we could say that capital F is concave up on the interval from zero to six. This is not gonna help us complete the table, but it is, if we're going to draw a graph, gonna give us some more detail. So on, not so much a fundamental theorem of calculus notes, F prime is increasing on the interval from zero to six. So capital F is concave up on the interval from zero to six. We note that f prime is flat on the interval from zero to six, so from, sorry, from six to nine. So f has no concavity. On the interval from six to nine. And then finally, we could note that f prime is decreasing on the interval from 9 to 12. So capital F is concave down on the interval from 9 to 12. This is not related to our fundamental theorem of calculus information. This is just stuff that we want to remember from before when we were talking about first and second derivatives and concavity. Any questions? Yes, Professor Lich, on the very last sentence, uh, we, you wrote down the capital F prime that could be meaning when I look at this, it could be the uh, entire derivative, am I right? No, F no. prime is the graph that we're looking at. Not the anti derivative, it's this graph. It's the graph shown in this function. F prime is the graph shown in this, in this uh, graph. F prime is the function shown in this graph and this graph is decreasing on the interval from nine to 12. In the statement that we're making about concavity, we're not worried about things like antiderivative. Okay. One more question, uh, Professor Lich, right here. You have the uh, interval from three to six, capital F prime. And then on the right, you have um, three equal big F of six minus big F of three. Mm -hmm. On the bottom, uh, could you please what 
it mean like the big f of six equal big f of three plus three? What does that mean? So all I did was take the fact that th since three is equal to f of six minus f of three, if we solve this for f of six by adding f of three to both sides, we can say that f of six is f of three plus three. How do you get the f of three plus three? How do you get that? I added f of three to both sides. So mm -hmm. if I have, so I have, it over. If I have this equation, three is equal to f of six minus f of three, I can add f of three to both sides. So this side becomes f of three plus three, and this is just f of six. If uh, a minus b is equal to c, then a is equal to c plus b. Oh, oh, I see it now. Thanks for this. Yeah. Much. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So, if we had an additional piece of information about the function capital F, then we would be able to complete this table of values. If, for example, we knew that capital F at zero was five. Then we would start off at five, decrease by three to two, increase by three back up to five, increase by six to 11, and increase by three to 14. So if we know something about the function capital F, then we'll be, we'd be able to actually complete the table of values. Any questions? All right, so tomorrow we're gonna to look at some more examples where we look at a graph, uh, use the area to figure out the changes, and then we'll look at a, uh, an additional piece of information. We'll be given a di an additional piece of information about the function so that we can actually complete a table. And then we'll talk about the form. We'll talk about the form that the antiderivative will take. All right, that's gonna do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.